uh, switch over at 42? Uh, I only just started recording. All right, switch over at 50 then. <laughs> Everybody, Dan here from the Lab Maniacs, and today I am bringing you another set review. I'm joined by Siggy. Hi. Um, and today we're going to be doing a set review of the newest expansion, Ixalan. I am I pronouncing that correctly? I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. I think so. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Is it? Because I actually heard yeah. from Reddit that uh, the correct pronunciation using real pronunciations is Ishalan, I think. Something about X's in I, Mesoamerican languages is... I, I think I read the same post, and it was something along the lines of, you can also do that, hmm. but the more uh, common way for it to be pronounced would probably be Ixalan. Gotcha. All right. Well, a set review for Ixalan, then. Uh, as with most things on our channel, we just want to specifically mention that this is a set review for competitive EDH. For those of you who might mostly be familiar with Battlecruiser EDH or more casual um, playgroups of EDH, the difference between competitive EDH and non-competitive EDH is actually quite distinct. So. If we look at how Wizards initially introduced Modern, they talked about it being a turn four format, which means people should be attempting to win or at least executing some kind of game plan by turn three or by turn four, excuse me. If we take those same terms and apply them to competitive EDH, uh, competitive EDH is basically that turn three format. So you're either trying to combo off in some way, either with Storm or with Flash Hulk or with any of a number of different options, or you are fully prepared to stop people that are going to be trying to combo off on turn three. So we're going to be looking at these cards much more closely from a perspective of, you know, a vintage player or a legacy player than from a casual EDH player. So while cards like, what is it, Gishoth? The, the giant <laughs> Nyasaurus Rex are yeah. awesome for casual EDH and make well, probably a sweet tribal deck. They're not something that we're going to be considering for competitive EDH because, spoiler alert, a 7-drop that makes dinosaurs better isn't on par with <laughs> cards like Ad Nauseam. So now that we've framed what we're going to be talking about, um, Siggy, take it away. Sure. The first card we're going to be talking about is quite uh, relevant in relation to one of the win conditions you talked about in your description just now, namely Flash Hulk. The first card is going to be Ashes of the Abhorrent. What do you think? I think it's sweet. This might be the card that I am most excited for in this set. Um, two mana white enchantments are historically very effective in competitive EDH. <laughs> you have yeah. things like no rod, well not no rod, but stony silence, whatever. <laughs> don't I yep. don't care. That are really really good at shutting off or gating particular strategies. So Ashes of the Abhorrent is incredibly efficient at stopping a lot of graveyard based strategies in a similar way to Graph Digger's Cage, although that's, you know, it's a little bit different. Um what Ashes of the Abhorrent, specifically like Siggy mentioned, stops is Flash Hulk combos that rely on um, Dread Return. So one of the more, maybe the fastest uh, combo deck in competitive EDH right now is Breakfast Hulk, brewed by Siggy, which utilizes Nomad Zencore and Cephalid Illusionist with the old Breakfast combo. Um, but basically, you can put your deck into your graveyard with a variety of strategies, and then you cast Dread Return to win. Ashes of the Abhorrent stops you from being able to cast Dread Return. And that's actually mm -hmm. huge, because Dread Return is one of the more powerful um, self-mill finishers in the format. And this very cleanly answers it. It also doesn't shut off um, 
reanimation type effects, which is really big for some of the bear decks like Blood Pot or like Hulk Weaver, because they utilize reanimation, but they don't reutilize they don't utilize casting spells from the graveyard, which is a really important distinction. Ooh. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, furthermore, one other important thing about this is that it doesn't just stop the Breakfast Hulk win, but also basically almost any other Hulk win. Anything that uses like a Blood Artist or a Zulaport Cutthroat for like karmic guide loops or something like that is also stopped by Ashes of the Abhorrent. And funnily enough, not by the first, but by the second ability. Yeah, the old Soul Sisters counters Splinter Twin sometimes combo. <laughs> yeah. um, and what's super awesome about that is that it doesn't stop your own. Yeah, you, like you just incidentally gain infinite life while you're gaining infinite life and killing your opponents. So it's a hate piece that slots into on curve, on color, basically expected decks that shuts off your opponents and doesn't even stop yours. So like I'm getting a foil of this for Hulk Weaver as soon as I humanly can. <laughs> like it even can be put into play off of Zer. It's oh, yeah. just it's just awesome. Um. I love it. I should probably move on because that's an awful lot of time to spend on one card. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's by far my favorite card in the set. Yep. And uh, the next card we have is also a white card. Also two mana, but it's a tiny bit different. We've got Tokatli Honor Guard. It's pretty cool. This is, um, you know, in the in the line of typical traditional white hate enchantments gets turned into turned into creatures or artifacts. This is the torpor orb getting turned into a creature. Um, it's a little awkward. It's so it's not bad. It's a torpor orb. So if you are in a meta where torpor orb is very effective, this is a redundant copy that also gives you timid triggers. The yep. downside is that Torpor Orb itself is also not great right now because it shuts off your win cons as a bear deck. You're either looking at stuff like Kiki Jiki and Blood Pod to finish you off, which Torpor Orb in this shuts off. You're looking at Hulk Lines in Hulk Weaver, which usually involve Karmic Guide and stuff like that, which this shuts off. Or you're playing some kind of... Um, I'm not going to name it because we can't agree on a name. Uh, Raza Bear's Demon Weaver nonsense. Uh, <laughs> and you're playing a Razaketh loop, which traditionally involves either Eternal Witness or Lean and Relic Order, which gets shut off by Torpor Orb. So the decks that would want this effect are actually like hard countered by this effect. And there's <laughs> not really a deck right now that can profitably use it. That's not to say there won't be, which is why we're talking about it. Because yep. there's probably soon going to be some kind of bear deck that decides to open itself up to get crushed by Cursed Totem and Linvala Keeper of Silence. <laughs> and instead just mainlines Torpor Orb effects. But I don't know what that deck is, so yeah. have at it, brother. <laughs> right now in the meta, Torpor Orb has, as you said, definitely fallen out of favor, uh, even to the extent that we've recently cut it from Teferi in favor of uh, Tormod Script. Yeah, graveyard decks are huge right now, and Torpor Orb just kind of shuts off the wrong stuff, really. Yeah. I guess it's it's in a position like Gaddock Teague is in. It stops everyone from winning, but it doesn't stop them from doing anything else. That is and that's very true, actually. Not where and you want to be. Yeah, if people already get to the point where they're basically able to win, but they just can't do it because of one hate piece, then they will probably find a way to get rid of that one particular hate piece very quickly. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of stuff that gets rid of things, <laughs> our next card on the list is an interesting one. We've got 
Perilous Voyage. So, it's a cool card, primarily because Jace is falling off a cliff. Um, <laughs> although, from what I've been told, spoilers or something or another, there's like a Nega Ixalan on the other side, so he's actually falling through to <laughs> something else. I, Seriously? I'm not sure, man. I was I was talking to one of my friends, hey, Will, about it, and he told me that uh, there's like a like an Ixalan to the minus one power or something. And like there's Jace is going to like fall through to somewhere. I don't know. There's like another map of Vixalon that has like the same golden magic city, but like everything else is different. So So, let me get this right. Um, This is basically like, Yu-Gi-Oh! Because people can't leave Ixalan. No, no, There's no. Like it's, not shadow the shadow re- it's not the Shadow Realm. <laughs> it's You're totally... saying that right now. How can we know? Fine. You really want to know what it is? It's a ripoff of the last D&D campaign I ran. <laughs> it's actually a ripoff. <laughs> I have the maps to prove it. It's actually just a ripoff. I mean, but Wizards didn't know that, and it's still their IP technically, so it's fine, <laughs> even though it was a homebrew, so... Nah, but whatever. Anyways, the card, not that you guys care about any of that stuff, because you're competitive EDH <laughs> players, presumably, so... It's a two-mana bounce spell. Another one. To heap onto the pile of Cyclonic Rift into the Royal, Winds of Rebuke... There's yep. probably loads others, but whatever. So... Things that are unique about this one. It can't target your own stuff, which mostly is just a straight drawback. Um, But it lets you scry. That's the upside. So it's worth mentioning. Um, I think the, the only deck I can think of that might want this is going to be Rashmi because scrying and really just top deck control in general is super important in that deck. And while you do tend to want things that can reset your Isochron Scepter if you have to play it early, um, it's less important than, like, bounce my own Candelabra kind of effects. So I'm I'm probably going to try it in Rashmi. I'm not sure it really fits into much else. I could be wrong or just missing something. Yeah, the niche I've kind of put this card into is basically decks that want bounce spells over other types of removal that also don't care about uh, bouncing their own stuff and uh, don't really have an interest in running Cyclonic Rift due to meta reasons. So let's say that I uh, didn't need Cyclonic Rift in Breakfast Talk at all. I would probably slot in Perilous Voyage instead. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically why I arrived at potentially Rashmi and probably not much else. Because, yeah. Um, So, what else do we have in blue? Uh, The other blue card we're going to talk about is uh, actually kind of coupled with the only black card we're going to be talking about. And that's Chart a Course and Costly Plunder. Yeah. So, um, two mana draw twos are always worth taking a look at. Uh, Right now, the only... Typically, run one is uh, Knight's Whisper, um, because it's one generic and a black, and it draws two at a very low cost. Chart, mm-hmm. of course, is pretty cool, because at worst, it's a uh, technically um, net even on cards, because you discard a card, but at best, it's just a straight draw two. Um, and that's, that's actually pretty relevant. So, in decks that want draw twos, and can reasonably profitably attack with creatures, this is going to be a pretty decent inclusion. The deck that I'm thinking of when I'm looking at this card is actually a post-tweak Doomtide. Um, Hmm. Because we consistently are drawing cards with Timna, 
and we are a doomsday deck secondarily but still uh so having a two mana draw two that works with what we are frequently doing is a pretty solid thing honestly so i think this is a card that's worth testing and that it may have been passed over by other people because it's like not a splashy card and it's an uncommon yeah i think i'm inclined to agree that it could be decent in Doomtide. Um, another reason why I think it's good is that it's just always a straight up draw to, and most of the time when you're going through your Doomsday pile, y even if you haven't attacked with a creature this turn, you probably don't particularly care about discarding that one card. Yeah, it could actually be an upside. Like this Ooh. is this is predict, but better to some Ooh. degree. Wait, well, oh, ish. That's... It 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 digs you too, but like it still puts it in the graveyard. So this may open up slightly better um, unearth type piles. So yeah, yeah. I I think it's absolutely worth looking at. I think it's a pretty cool card, and I think regardless of if you can attack with a creature or not, there's benefits. I like it. Me too. And so then the other one, uh, Costly Plunder. This is a draw two that has an additional cost to cast, which is sacking an artifact or sacking a creature. Which, yeah. So there's a lot of times in different decks where you will profit from sacking an artifact or a creature. This gives you a way to get you necessarily your own hate pieces off the board if they're interfering with you from winning. Those decks aren't traditionally looking for draw twos, though. Um, one of the cards that I was thinking of that this interacts reasonably well with is Jaleva. Um, I know Jaleva Slimlist frequently will run cards like Diabolic Intent because it's a demonic tutor that would let you reset Jaleva. Mm, Obviously, that's less relevant now because a lot of people have started switching over to Kess. But in a Chileva deck, which... So, I think Chileva needs to potentially shift a little bit to gain back some of her meta share. Um, and I think that might be moving slightly more along the Doomsday line. Uh, and this is a card that interacts well with Doomsday because it's a draw two for two. Um, and lets you reset Jaleva. So I don't know if it's going to really see as much play necessarily as Charter Course, because Charter Course, I think, is the better of the two. But this is worth looking at. Yeah, it's certainly nice to have what actually is a strictly better Altos Reap. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You don't see a whole lot of instant speed draw twos in uh, at two mana. Yeah. And this costs less. Well, costs easier, I guess. So yeah, it's an option that now exists. Yep. Another uh, option that will be opened up to us with the release of Ixalan is Fiery Cannonade. How do you feel about that one? I think my biggest hope for it is that it makes Grixis Pirates a thing in standard. <laughs> but I think it does deserve mention for competitive EDH. Pyroclasm type effects have become a lot more mainstream lately with the Timna's catapulting of Bears decks to prominence. And... This is the least cost-restrictive instant speed um, non-modal, uh, non-scalable. Not No, it's just the least cost-restrictive um, instant speed Clasm that I am aware of, I think. Yeah, um, Kozilek's Return also exists, but uh, the only upside of playing Kozilek's Return over this is that it can't get countered by Hydroblast, which uh, I don't think anyone is playing. Yeah. It's it's now a thing. I'm not sure if... I. Is there a single relevant pirate in competitive EDH? Um, there would have been one, yeah. 
but we're going to talk about that in a bit. <laughs> yeah, so this is a thing. You can maybe play it, I guess. Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. The uh, next card to talk about is Rampaging Ferocidon. This one's fun. I I really just wanted to get a dinosaur on here. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, of the dinosaurs, this is the most playable. Three mana, three, three, and it's castable. Uh, It costs red, so it's slightly less castable. It has Menace, which is slightly more relevant nowadays, I guess. Um, Players Can't Gain Life is relevant because... Aetherflex Reservoir is the only real Storm Wind Con at this point, and that requires people to gain life. Mm-hmm. But that's not really going to come up super often. Um, the third ability is the slightly more relevant one. Uh, it it Ooh, yeah. turns off uh, Kiki Kills, which hurts Blood Pod. It turns off... Um, Hulk kills, uh, blood yeah. artist style Hulk kills, which is also relevant. Um, specifically because of actually the second ability. So, like if they're using blood artist or Zulaport Cutthroat, they gain life. But because he prevents the life loss, every damage dealt through that combo is also dealt to the combo's controller. So they have to be at passively <laughs> a higher life total. Which, if you are playing a three three menace for three, you're probably not letting that happen. Yeah. So it's it's like a vague counter meta type card. I don't think there's a deck that this goes in right now because of Blood Pod's win condition being shut off by this card. So because mm-hmm. it's not uh it's not opponents, it's everybody. Yeah. So yeah. It's certainly a cool thing to have and something to keep in mind if your meta is crowded with the uh, aforementioned win conditions. However, I do feel like it's probably not gonna uh, be any higher than maybe board status for most lists. But we got a dinosaur on here, so yeah. I'm I'm pleased. Um, we also would have gotten a pirate on here, but unfortunately, uh, Wizards of the Coast are going to release Functional Errata for one of the cards in Ixalan that otherwise would have been pretty spicy, uh, Hostage Taker. You were... I I think that card was stupid. I'm so glad Wizard is eroding it. No card should go infinite with itself to provide yeah. <laughs> ETBs and LTBs. That's just dumb. I am a bit sad that we spent uh, an evening brewing up a Vela the Nightclad list specifically for this card. You say we? I specifically didn't chime in because I knew this was going to get eroded. <laughs> and I knew it was a huge waste of time. Oh, well. I think but I even yeah. told you that. So, uh, yeah, you probably No belly did, aching. But... I'm pretty sure I said that the day it got uh, leaked. <laughs> it, it's a good thing that they eroded it, but it is a bit sad because it would have made uh, for a very interesting deck. Yeah. But that's a thing that should not exist. Yes. Yeah. So, Let's uh, yeah. move on to more real cards that actually work in the way they're going to be printed. Uh, there's a cycle of legendary enchantments in this set that turns into lands, and it's really interesting. The first one we're going to be talking about is Search for Ascanta. So before I talk about this card, I just want to say that I love this cycle. I love that they made legendary enchantments that transform into legendary lands. I think it's really cool. Um, A lot of people have just been giving glowing recommendations to wizards about this design space because it's really cool. 
And I think it's a thing that deserves to be explored more. Um, so about this card specifically, the front side is pretty mediocre. Yeah. It's not terrible because it gives you a bit of top deck control in the way that uh, gets you out of like brainstorm locks and gets you out of top locks. So like if you can't shuffle your deck and you've seen the top three and you know they're just junk, this is a way to get out of that. Um, it also gives you a bit of potential to mill in case like you're looking to entomb something but don't quite have the means to do it. Then mm -hmm. cards like Brainstorm will help set this up. Um, but yeah, overall, it's not super impressive. But it transforms into a pretty sweet card, which oh, yeah. is a land that taps for blue unrestrictively or lets you basically impulse for three mana and a tap, which is cool. Like, that's a that's a pretty big effect. I don't think we have anything like that on land at all. Well, now we do, but... Yeah. Um, so in... It's, it's a really powerful mana sink. In slower decks, I think that side of it is going to be extremely powerful. It does something that nothing's really done before. Um, you know, outside of, like, junk like Miko Koro or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, when I was looking at this card, my first thought was... I kind of want to try this in Rashmi again. Yeah. Uh, because top deck control is important because, well, mostly because top deck control is important. The front is <laughs> super mediocre and it's probably going to force me to cut it after not too long, but I want to try because I think it does do some stuff for me that I want to do. And I think it's pretty easy to flip. And I think the back is very strong. And isn't something that I can get in another card, basically. Yeah, I would have loved to play this into Ferry, but uh like historically speaking, we can't run treasure crews into Ferry because we don't fill our graveyard quickly enough. That's why we only run dig through time. And I feel like we'd run into similar issues with this card, even if it can set itself up in a way. It's just not going to be fast enough. It will be fine, I think, for hard control decks, like you said, Rushmi, uh, maybe even Tassiger, because Tassiger plays even better with its top deck, thanks to Tassiger's ability. And the backside on this card is just so insanely good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, there, there is, however, a pattern to all of these cards, with the backside being incredible, because the next card we're going to talk about, Growing Rights of Itlamok, is basically the same. The front side is kind of mediocre, but the backside is nuts. Yeah, so the front side is a really slow, really, really slow, <laughs> awkward impulse thing for creatures, basically. Um, and if you have four or more creatures, it'll transform. So... Things that this has going for it, it's an end step trigger, which means you can trigger it the turn you play it, which is different from Search for Ascanta, which is an upkeep trigger, which stinks, but life goes on. The back of this is an improved Gaia's Cradle, yep. because it taps for mana even if you don't have creatures in play, which is absurd. Um, it really is. So... I've actually personally been a bit harsh with this card for a few reasons. So first off, the fact that it taps for mana when there's no creatures in play is fairly irrelevant because it's a three drop, which means you already have other mana and it only transforms if you have four more creatures in play. 
so you already have creatures. So if someone board wipes, you still have mana. And if someone doesn't board wipe, you already had four creatures, so you're not <laughs> going to use the first ability. The second thing is that the front on this, while I, I, honestly the front is like basically on par with Search for Azkanta, they both just kind of suck. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm being completely honest, the fronts of both really suck. Uh, that's also a, a part of the cycle, I think. I don't know if you mentioned that, but yeah, the, the fronts I all suck think... on all of these. They're just the... garbage. Yeah, the front on the red one is the least bad out of all of them, yeah. but it's still <laughs> not... Only it didn't transform to crap. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the front is junk. If you want to play something like that, cast, like, Lead the Stampede, which is the same speed, the same cost, looks at more cards, and gets you more cards. Um, and the back is already a card that you can play on its own that doesn't cost mana or an additional card slot. And can be crop rotated into. Exactly. And that's the other part. So not only is it an effect that already exists on a card, which means it's already being played and it's definitely already being played, but if you really need a redundant copy, you can run crop rotation. And if you really need multiple copies of Gaia's Cradle, you should be reconsidering your deck decisions. <laughs> because you, you just don't need that much mana. Like, you either go infinite, or you you don't need that much mana, really. <laughs> like, there's there's even Nykthos, I guess. But you don't, you don't, you don't need that much mana. Like, it's, yeah. it's fine. Just play Gaia's Cradle is basically the way I've looked at this card. In I budget decks, think... it's different, but... True. Yeah, but I think you're raising a good point here. Uh, not just about amounts of mana that this can make, but uh, also about colors. If we look at the decks that tend to play Gaia's Cradle, they are either Hate Bears style decks, which uh, are heavily reliant on white for their uh, key creatures rather than just green mana. Green is usually in the deck for mana docks or uh, stuff like Root Maze, Carpet of Flowers, these kind of cards, while uh, White has the actual key effects, Rest in Peace, Stony Silence, Rule of Law, and so on. This doesn't provide White, which is unfortunate. Furthermore, the other types of decks that run Gaia's Cradle are decks like uh, Bug Sidisi, I'm not sure if it's still in there, but it was for a while. And uh, I would definitely Bug go Sidisi. to Yisan or Selvala before oh, I yeah. put a Bug Sidisi as Cradle decks. True, those two also <laughs> exist. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. it's it's less bad in those two though. But in actually, a deck I don't like... know about that. True. So no, in... actually, it's similarly bad in Buxy DC in and Silvala because you basically yeah. want to end the game before you can afford to just spend three mana and then pass the turn to do uh, the front side of this card. Yeah. And in Yisan, as Shaper very succinctly summed up on the subreddit the day it was spoiled, this either delays you from casting Yisan a turn which is terrible, or it delays you from activating Yis on a turn, which is <laughs> similarly terrible. Yep. Like you, so it's 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 far better to advance your game plan for the same amount of mana than to basically take an entire turn off to give yourself more mana than you realistically likely needed. So while an awesome card in budgetless list, this probably does not have applications. As I mentioned before, in budget decks this becomes far more relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but I would rather see you take a copy, flip it over, scribble out that first line of text on it, <laughs> and just play it as is, if you can't afford a guy's cradle. Or maybe not scribble it out, but like put like a block on the sleeve or something. I don't know, don't deface your cards. But <laughs> you, you yeah. know what I mean. Just, just use it as a proxy cradle if you really want to. Okay, let's... Move on. I think we've spent enough time uh, <laughs> yeah. going on about this card. Because the next card, uh, in my personal opinion at least, does have a niche among similar cards. 
We're talking about Sentinel Totem. Yeah, this card is pretty sweet, honestly. Um, it's the... For starters, for starters, it's an incredibly powerful graveyard hate effect that Wizards printed into Standard. Mm -hmm. Can we just take a moment to, like, be so happy that the development philosophy has gotten to a point where you can print powerful graveyard hate the set after a graveyard focused focused block like this yeah. hasn't happened since rest in peace came out and you know that was like <laughs> the best standard that i've ever played and yeah, I... the standard made me switch to pokemon standard so like <laughs> this is pretty good um I the like second it. part of it yeah so like it's it's more or less, it's Tormod's Crypt that costs some mana, but lets you scry. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's... I mean, so the cards this is going to be compared to are, as you said, Tormod's Crypt, uh, Relic of Progenitus, and uh, Nihil Spellbomb. Now, let's look at all of these cards on... Uh, the basis of how much mana they cost and what they provide. Uh, Tormod Script, as you said, zero mana, exiles one graveyard. Uh, Relic of Progenitus, one mana to cast, one mana to activate. Two mana total, exiles all graveyards, but also draws you a card, which can be nice. Uh, Nihil Spellbomb, one mana to cast, uh, exiles one graveyard, and it needs one in the black if you also wanted to draw a card. Well, it's an additional black. Yeah. yeah. So it's one in the black total. Yeah. Sentinel Totem is one mana total, exiles all graveyards, and comes with a free scry, which is worth about 0 0.6 of a draw. Yeah, I think it's absolutely a powerful card. I think that it's probably going to see some play. Yeah, I'm fairly positive. I have been thinking about putting this into Teferi over Tormod Script, but we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah, I'm I'm considering it for Shimmerzer as well. Like, so losing your graveyard is really awkward in that deck. But off of, uh, like, on a Shimmer turn, you're usually going to have Helm of Awakening, and it basically just provides a free scry with mm. some insulation, which is pretty cool. True. And, like, we, we dabble across running cards like Tormod's Crypt and stuff like that, so it's, it's something I kind of want to try out. Seems decent. I could also see this being played in Rush Me, I guess. Yeah, I mean, as long as you haven't awkwardly cast your reality shift or something. <laughs> True. That is sometimes a bit of a concern. Yeah, all those integrated win cons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, it's slot efficiency, but whatever. If you prefer a card that's just one card that wins the game, uh, a new legendary creature from Ixalan should probably serve you well. Tishana, Voice of Thunder. She's cool. People have been talking about her since the leak, uh, the old those rare test print foil leak, because she was mostly on there. We could see everything but the mana cost, basically, which for competitive EDH is only partially relevant for her specifically. Mm -hmm. Because she provides another optional commander for the Simic Food Chain decks. So Zagana Food Chain, actually I think top 16, the yeah. winter CDH tournament, which is pretty cool. Um, so it plays the Mist Holograph and Eternal Scourge, Food Chain, make infinite mana, do a thing. Which <laughs> with Zagana is draw your deck, basically. Um, what Tishana does is let you draw your deck in a slightly different way. So Zagana enters the battlefield with 
uh, what is it? Plus one, plus one counters equal to the largest power among creatures you control. Yep. Uh, and then you draw cards equal to her power as an ETB trigger. So you draw like N plus one cards where N is the biggest power among creatures you control minimum one because Zagana. So you would draw your deck. What Tashana does is draws cards equal to the number of creatures you control more akin to what Regal force does when it enters the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a really powerful effect, because if you just vomit some dorks, um, then you can realistically be casting her on, you know, turn three, turn four. If you, like, run out of gas playing a tempo control game, draw another five cards, and, like, what <laughs> happens to her is irrelevant, because, well, until Shaper Gilded Drakes are six games, in a, or six times in a game. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. It's, it's fine, I guess. But she gives you a whole lot more advantage in the middle and early game, in my opinion, as a guy with absolutely no experience playing Civic Food Chain. Um, so I think I think she's absolutely worth considering as a new commander for that deck, basically, with, you know, some tweaks, because you can go wider and run more dorks and more little garbage, mm -hmm. and you don't have to try and value some larger creatures. Yeah, And you have no maximum hand size when she's in play. If that's a thing you care about, I mean, it's a nice bonus to have. And yeah. another important uh, part about this card is that rather than Zagana costing two green, green, blue, blue, this one just costs five and then one green and one blue. So she is much more castable, and you can actually run cards like uh, Mana Vault, and it makes sense. And like Gaia's Cradle. <laughs> Play like yeah. dork, 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 cradle and an island, and you cast her on turn three, <laughs> which is so much more reasonable, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, not costing double blue is big. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Tishana, I think she's awesome. I think she'll make a great Simic food chain commander. I don't know how good Simic food chain is at this point, but it's a thing. Yeah. So she's pretty good at it. And... Yeah, that was the last card we had. So, uh, Ixalan, overall, what do you think? I think, so from a competitive EDH perspective, it's fine. There's some roll fillers, there's some, like, kinda neat cards. There's nothing that I, I don't think is going to be format-defining in the way that Aetherflux Reservoir, Paradox Engine, and Partners, really, um, have done in, like, recent memory in the, like, Kaladesh-ish times frame. From a set design perspective and from, like, magic futurism perspective, I think Ixalan is incredible. I think <laughs> this is by far the biggest step back towards what I perceive as the golden age of sets, as I've seen in a long time. They've reverted on how mythics are printed. They've started printing the stuff that they originally defined as mythic, which is big, splashy, not necessarily tournament constructive viable, like uh, Grim Flayer as a mythic, <laughs> um, or like that tiny little raptor dude with like Megamorph. What, I don't even remember what that card is, honestly. They've pushed those, those mythic quality cards back to rare like you have regisaur alpha which is an incredibly powerful rare that thing is a bomb in limited. oh yeah um so the power concentration for tournament cards is being pushed back to rare mythics are big and splashy like what is it star of extinction <laughs> oh yeah. i love that card that, that is, is the so good. the most mythic card i have seen in a long time Seven and mana, i love it i love it deal red. 20 it's... damage to creatures and planeswalkers and it's destroy so land. like great it's awful it's a terrible card it is so splashy and mythic that it is it's it's mythic that is a mythic rare yeah absolutely hands down that is a mythic rare that is the most mythic rare i think i have ever seen <laughs> honestly it's it's, it's pretty yeah. high up there definitely it's awesome they've so they've done that they've done the power concentration pushed back to rare they've had some phenomenal reprints spell oh. pierce getting a reprint is huge opt getting printed yeah, back into modern boy. printed into modern 
blew my mind to see that. Opt is amazing. I love that card in competitive EDH. Like I'm for I try to force it into every deck I play. Honestly, it really it's good. It probably only belongs in Shimmers or something, but I love Opt. And it's in modern now. You can play it in like Just Guy Flash. You can probably play Just Guy Flash again or like, you know, whatever <laughs> Whatever, like the old traditional American control decks, like Opt is huge for that. Yeah. And then you have cards like Sentinel Totem, which is a return to powerful and functional graveyard hate. Like, I, Wizards, so Sa- Sam Stoddard's design philosophy of threats have to be more powerful than answers. Dumbest thing to happen to Wizards in ever. <laughs> Honestly, we've never had more standard bands than because of it. So this reversion back to the the style of design and the style of development that we had back in like realistically the start of the mythic era is incredible. So I think I was actually asking about this. I think like uh who was it? Like Eric Lauer was the was the lead developer on this? Um I, I think just... it was co-led by Eric Lauer and Sam Stoddard, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sam, honestly, for reverting your policy on how answers and uh, threats interact. I just, I cannot overstate how much I love this set. It is everything I I wanted it to be. And it it makes me, it makes me so excited for mm. Dominaria. Oh, what? oh, so my excited. Like if we're going to get this Dominaria kind of, this, it's it's going to be <gasps> crazy. I'm so ready. I'm so ready. It's this gonna is be so I'm, good. Yeah. None I mean, of that has anything to do with competitive EDH, but yeah, I brilliant. I love already. this set and everything that it stands for in terms of the progression of Magic's design and development. All right, and you I've know, said my piece. I've blown like 10 minutes pontificating <laughs> because I'm so excited about Ixalan. Yeah, yeah, no, this I is going to be... I haven't been this hyped for a set in so long. Same. Like, my, yeah. my excitement about uh, non-competitive EDH magic kind of died down over the course of, like, Armand Kit especially. I yeah, used that, to that like, was... closely follow the Pro Tour and everything. Not so much in our kit, and now with Ixalan, there is no way I'm not gonna watch the Pro Tour. Right? This set, right? Just looks amazing. I haven't watched a Pro Tour since like it was, it was like actual Mantis Rider versus Siege Rhino, <laughs> and that was like the only one I'd watched since I started <laughs> playing Magic. Honestly, like that was I. I'm so excited for the set. Thank you, Wizards. Thank you all of you for watching. Thank you, Siggy, for dealing with me uh, spouting nonsense. (laughs) Um, We are the Lab Maniacs, and this was your competitive EDH set review for Ixalan. We'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.